Okay, so everybody welcome. This is Daniel Wynn from A4M Business Development Manager. Tonight I have the honor to bring on Dr. Sangeeta Patty. She is the Medical Director of the Sejun Medical Center in Orlando, Florida. And she graduated top of her medical class at the University of Maryland. And she has a philosophy. Her philosophy is to use the most natural solution to restore the body's balance on both the inside and the outside. And she also has a wonderful practice that is growing by leaps and bounds. And I hope she shares all of her secrets with you. So Dr. Patty, welcome. Thank you. Well, I want to welcome everybody to this uh, webinar. It's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So some of us are actually almost ready to go to bed. Um, but I wanted to, I, I think many of you may know that I'm an OBGYN and um, I basically transitioned from the routine practice of obstetrics and gynecology in DC, uh, Washington DC, to um, incorporating some more restorative and natural mechanisms into the patients I saw because as I started traveling the world, uh, which I did under a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, project that I worked on for seven years, I realized that there were many things uh, that were uh, restorative to the body that uh, did not require pharmaceutical and surgical interventions. So that was my foray into this. This is, of course, many years ago. Um, and yes, I did actually spend some time even with a medicine woman who used the kind of things that you see here. But what I want to present you tonight is basically a model that really has been tested and tried over the last seven years. And we've been using this model very effectively, continuously building pieces onto it as we, um, as we learn more and more uh, in this field. Uh, and as an OBGYN, it was pretty easy for me to enter in the realm of uh, starting to prescribe hormones because hormones was a natural um, jump from what I did and actually what propelled this was the book that Suzanne Summers wrote, wrote and the Women's Health Initiative study which created such a uh, big stir that many of our patients just came right off of the hormones. So we uh, ended up having patients come in through the book with Suzanne Summers' book and we ended up having to learn something about bioidentical hormones. So I started with the bioidentical hormones, and I have to say that even when I started, I would, I would actually uh, call a compounding pharmacy and ask the compounding pharmacy what to do. Luckily, when I opened my practice, I only had five patients the first month, so I had almost a week per patient. So it really wasn't that hard uh, to, to figure out what to do, but I would, I would call on all the forces to figure out what to do, even for hormones. So for those of you who are not OBGYNs, um, you can realize that actually it, it's kind of a learning process for everybody because the, the prescriptions are so um, quite a bit different when you uh, start to write them. Um, but very quickly found out that I needed to pay attention to the nutritional status of so the hormones didn't work. Um, and then after a while realized that the bowel and the liver are actually extreme, are actually important for the hormonal activation. Um, for thyroid and testosterone and estrogen and the status of the mind and the status of the body. So the five-point model is the one that you're seeing here on the screen um, and really it was developed not from sources like this but really from the references that are in our regular literature and um, at this point this model has been applied to um, over 6,000 patients with uh, very good success over the last uh, Let's see, it's, it's been about seven years now that we've been using this model. And um, our practice has a number of different integrative type of, pra of practitioners, a few uh, medical doctors, myself, two internists, one that specializes in integrative cancer therapies, and one of them who uh, specializes in weight loss program. We have a doctor of oriental medicine that comes straight from China and then one that comes from here. We have two nurse practitioners, chiropractors, and some uh, massage therapists. And we offer a lot of different types of services which came on board slowly. I can tell you I didn't start with this whole team. I started with myself. And that was uh, this practice that I'm, uh, that I'm talking about at the Sejun Institute for Restorative and Regenerative Medicine started in January of 2005. 
Um, and you can see the numbers per month uh, grew slowly but steadily. And, and for those of you who are wondering how one markets these kind of practices, 85% of these practices grow from word of mouth alone. So once you have one happy camper, they all of a sudden are bringing their mothers, their brothers, their sisters, and even some of them asking advice about their pets. So it really extends much beyond just the first person you see. So the best way to do this is to really have one patient who you spend all your time trying to get well, and, uh, and then that it grows from there. And uh, some of you may know this, but the initial sequence, the sequence that we use is we do an initial consult where we always rate the energy, the sleep, the pain, and the mood. And we always do uh, hormonal testing. We always start in the serum um, and then uh, nutritional testing and bone density. Bone density is a measure of the body's stability. It, it gives you a, whatever the bone is doing. Whatever's happening to the bone is happening to the, the brain, the heart, the skin, and everything else. We always do a physical exam. We always give a written plan of action and follow up the patients at four-week intervals until they're symptom-free. Um, and what we know here is that if you start to follow patients up with longer intervals, you start to see a situation where the patients start to become unhappy. They, they really, the patients who are coming to us are looking for results rather quickly so that they want to be seen. And the aim is to restore over three to six months. The, the most patients within three months were good and we can actually see them just twice a year. Patients who have adrenal insufficiency, we end up seeing them and correcting them over six months if, if it's severe adrenal sufficiency. Um, we, we use a symptom-based approach mostly, rating things on a scale of one to ten. Um, and you can see that the thyroid symptoms are huge. Are, if you see the, the practice, what you find is that 95% of the patients, we recommend thyroid or thyroid, some kind of thyroid support, but even a prescription of thyroid. Um, and our patients' age range actually is from um, all the way from age of 9 to age of 89. Uh, currently, and about 20% of our patients are actually under the age of 20, uh, because as the wife comes in, then the, she wants to bring her husband, and then they want to bring their children. Uh, so we see a lot of patients for things like uh, younger patients for things like uh, ADD and um, insomnia and weight gain. And what we've recognized is that even if we use thyroid in these patients initially, once we get the nutrition right, we end up being able to wean them off of it. As they get into the 40s, it's harder to wean them off of it. But I always get this question about once you're on thyroid, you're always stuck on thyroid. Well, that depends upon you, the, the resiliency of the thyroid to begin with. Is it able to bring it back? I always like to show you my, um, my uh, symptom list because I want you to see that we're not asking patients to fill pages and pages and pages of symptoms. Um, we do have a little bit of uh, a one-page review of symptoms, uh, systems, but this is uh, a hormonally uh, directed symptom sheet, and from this we pretty much can tell some of the hormonal deficiencies they may, may be seeing, and we have one for men and one for women. Um, and I always get the question of uh, what I test, why I test serum, and the most important thing to know is that whether we test urine or serum or saliva, we're really only getting a piece of the picture because uh, whatever the hormone level is, the, at the end of the day, the clinical picture is dependent upon the receptor site function and the nutrients that are involved. Like this is the insulin receptor, and as you can see, it actually requires not just the insulin, but also certain nutrients, receptor site function, so on and so forth. So. When we measure the saliva, we're going to get a tissue level. We measure the urine, we'll get the level in the urine, which is a metabolite, which is extremely accurate uh, for metabolites. And the serum gives you another measure. Um, we usually start in the serum only because it's covered by insurance and because most of our guidance for hormonal, um, hormonal levels and dosing is done by the clinical picture. Um, and that's because 
the clinical picture is what actually tells you what the receptor site function is and whether or not you actually have the nutrients to, uh, to activate uh, the hormone. Um, we're always looking for optimal values. If you look at the literature right now, it's showing pretty clearly as an example that fasting blood sugars in the 70 range are going to be most protective on your cardiovascular system. Similarly, a blood pressure of 60 to 70 is most protective on your cardiovascular system. But we really don't call it until it's 126 and it's diabetes, or 100 and it's prediabetes. And the fact of the matter is that in this kind of pra uh, practice, uh, and the kind of medicine that we're trying to practice, the restorative approach applies to the process. And even the cardiovascular literature now is showing that a person who reach, achieves uh, or re reaches a diastolic pressure of 90 has already had a 15-year uh, damage to the vessel lining and stiffening of the lining by the time we call it. So we're really operating at, a, at the illness level rather than the optimal or wellness level. So we basically explain this concept to each and every one of our patients when they come through the door so that they are aware that we will be interpreting our labs in the optimal range. Similarly for vitamin D, similarly for bone density, you can imagine a minus one and then we call it abnormal. But that's already almost three standard deviations off of strong bone. Um, these are the serum labs that we get, and I think that this webinar will be posted so you can see that you know we're getting a nice idea of thyroid, uh, ovarian, and testicular function, pituitary function. Um, you always want to make sure about pituitary function, um, and you know some various things like urine NTX. And one of the things we did to this panel because we weren't able to do the iodine testing on everybody, so we've actually added a urine spot iodine to this testing recently. I can't tell you how well those results will go, but um, we, we have been trying to get all our patients to do the challenge uh, iodine test, and it just is something that, that doesn't end up happening in all the patients, so this way at least we get some ideas. Other tests we routinely do are examine the DEXA, and then the other ones are as appropriate. Um, and then we always do the nutritional testing. We do functional intracellular analysis, vitamin D, ferritin, and an iodine spot or urine iodine spot test. Um, so in applying this model, as you know, the hormones uh, basically change every year, and all of these hormones keep changing. When I'm discussing this with a patient, I actually start and I build this picture from this picture right here and show them how the metabolic hormones change first, which is thyroid, insulin, and cortisol. Um, so thyroid, insulin, and cortisol change from the age of 9 or 10. Every time we have a stressor, the cortisol goes up, the thyroid goes down. After a certain age, that thyroid recovery is less than 50%. So what I tell my patients is that even if you lie within the normal range for thyroid, you're not going to be in the optimal range compared to where you were before. And at the, by the age of 40, you're talking about a 50% decline in thyroid, and therefore just about everybody will have those kind of symptoms by the time they reach that point. Um, we all, in coming to nutrients, we know that nutrient deficiencies prevent the action of hormones. You can see that new, specific nutrients are needed for hormonal activation. Um, and so you could have a progesterone deficiency or a thyroid functional deficiency, and it might not have to do with the level of the hormone. It may have to do with the level of the activator. Um, this is results that were published in JAMA and various other uh, journals showing that just to convert T4 to T3 needs a whole bunch of different specific nutrients that you're looking for. Um, that's why measuring nutrients is, becomes very important. Um, just to mention, the crux of the nutritional program that we actually teach um, is based upon food, but we do have carefully selected supplements and then measurement. Um, and I'll be showing you some of that measurement today. The third component of our program is detoxification. And generally, we start with the hormones and the nutrients. And as the patients start to feel better and they're nutrified, that's the time to start detoxifying. You do not start detoxifying when the patient is lying on the bed and feeling lousy. And once we start getting some of the hormonal levels up, they're sleeping, their energy is up, we know that there's nutrients in the body, that's when we start to work with liver and bowel and heavy metals and uh, inflammatory diets and so on. 
As far as detoxification, there's two steps. The first step is to reduce the toxic burden, and that's the toxic bur burden of all inhaled substances, all substances that are taken in, pesticides in the food and home, preservatives, dyes, petroleum, skin care products that are uh, based in petroleum, um, animal-based products, we know those are inflammatory, heavy metals, and electromagnetic radiation, we know that this has a profound effect on our thyroid and especially the genital organs. Um, so these are two areas which the best you can do to protect yourself, we tell the patients, is to make sure the rooms are free of electromagnetic radiation. I can't tell you how many uh, teenagers with sleep issues we've corrected just by asking them to turn off the computers, take the cell phone out of the bed, and uh, remove Wi-Fi zone from the room. And this is something you're going to find is also prevalent in colleges these days because everybody has Wi-Fi running everywhere. That's the sign of a, of a well, well uh, organized college is one that has Wi-Fi running in every uh, area. The step two is to optimize the body's detoxification process, which means to increase the tissue pH through plants and oxygen, but then to optimize the function of the liver in phase one and phase two detoxification, um, which are important for activating thyroid and testosterone, getting the bowel to move three times a day, and when you're doing detoxification, you always start with the bowel first because if you, if you enhance the liver's detoxification ability and it's dumping into an intestine that's not moving three times a day, all of those toxins are just reabsorbed. So bowel and liver go together, and we know that even uh, many of the hormones are actually processed in the bowel. And then we know that the big holder of toxicities in the body is the fat tissue. The lymphatics drain the fat tissue, which means and the lymphatics actually run two to five millimeters under our skin, which means that if we have even a pair of underwear on, we're actually suppressing the ability of the lymphatic system to drain that fat tissue in that area. Bras, underwears, these are all, you know, I guess we were actually meant to run around without any clothes. Um, but the kidney is another part of the detoxification um, mechanism, and so is the skin. So in detoxification, you want to pay attention to the entire system not only uh, getting re reducing the toxic burden, but also increasing the body's ability to detoxify. In the mind area, we teach the most important thing we teach for the mind part of our model is for people to uncommit their time schedule. And I would tell you, this starts with us. In other words, you know, going through the schedule and uncommitting weekends and uncommitting uh, evenings, like all of us, of course, are signed on to this thing tonight, but what you'll find is the body and especially the adrenal glands and the immune system do not recover until we have one time. You can't fix uh, a, a car engine while the engine is running. And of course, for our patients with adrenal fatigue, this becomes absolutely critical, but even to prevent adrenal fatigue, this becomes critical. I can't tell you, I don't know how many of you are seeing this, but adrenal fatigue is one of the things that well, over just the seven years has increased by almost 100% in my practice. And I don't know whether it's because we're getting a reputation or whether it's because the people are sicker out there, but I think it's a little comp of, a, of the both. Um, in the body area, we ask people to exercise in an aerobic range and oxygenated. If they exercise in an anaerobic range and create lactic acid for long period of time, the pH of the body goes down, and that's precisely why people who are exercising too hard cannot lose weight through that mechanism. So we tell them if they're able to talk through this, talk through their exercise, they're oxygenating. And actually, if we see people who are extremely fatigued and have any kind of adrenal insufficiency, we tell them to focus their exercise on breathing, being outdoors, grounding to the ground, um, and doing things like yoga. Um, so using this model, we've actually been very successful in um, with, with you know the five areas, working in the hormones, the nutrients, detoxification, mind, uh, stresses, dealing with mind stresses and body stresses, we've been able to um, correct a number of different things uh, like fibromyalgia, infertility, depression, memory impairment, rheumatoid, osteoporosis, psoriasis, cardiac dysfunction, things like that. 
Um, I'm actually going to go through two cases. One is a fibromyalgia type case and the other one is an infertility case, just to demonstrate this today. Um, so this is a case of a 40-year-old male business owner with a diagnosis of fibromyalgia and was seen at Shands and around the country complaining of severe fatigue with an energy level of 1 to 2 over 10, severe pain all over with a pain scale of 9, 10, not sleeping, anxiety and panic attacks, memory loss, cognitive dysfunction, and acid reflux. Now, I can't tell you how many men we are starting to see, and even women, in this kind of category, where they have high-level jobs and they're facing all kinds of economic issues, and they end up in this kind of a position. Um, so uh, this gentleman who had this scenario was on prednisone. He was also for sleep on Xanax and on Asifex for the reflux. And all of us know that, of course, Asifex is going to decrease the absorption of magnesium, calcium, iron, and various other things. Um, and he actually wasn't working at the time we saw him because he had, uh, he, well, he had reduced his work at that time. But he came in hoping that we would be able to get him back on his feet immediately um, so that he could rejoin the, the forces and run his company. Um, so for this patient, we discussed how his symptoms and fibromyalgia was caused by imbalances in each of the five areas, and they're always looking for one little magic pill, but it's, it becomes very important to educate them on the entire model. Um, and obviously, we ordered the labs that I showed you, which is the serum labs and, and the nutritional labs, but usually at the very first visit, I start something. And in a patient like this, it would be very safe to say that if you can help with the sleep, you are going to start correcting the adrenal gland. And anybody in this scenario with the fibromyalgia type diagnosis, which we know really is not a diagnosis but of exclusion. You have fatigue, you have pain, we don't know why, it's fibromyalgia. Um, so the thing that I have found to be absolutely most critical in these patients is correcting their sleep because during sleep they're correcting their adrenal glands if they get into REM4 sleep. So this is why when patients tell you, oh, I'm sleeping fine, but I wake up once or twice. Well, if it takes four hours of solid sleep to get into REM4 sleep, and then it takes two and a half more hours to recover the adrenals and the immune system, you actually need seven to eight solid hours in order to get that kind of correction. So waking up in the middle of the night doesn't work. So in this patient, we started with melatonin 0.5, which is our test dose. As you know, many people have nightmares with melatonin. And it's safe to use melatonin because we know by the age of 40, your melatonin level is only 10%. Your natural body production is, is very low, and melatonin is a major anti-cancer hormone. So it's fair to assume that a 40-year-old businessman will be low in melatonin. The highest dose is 20 milligrams, so we just tell them to keep going up until they get nightmares and then back down. It's also fair to use DHEA uh, clinically in this patient because it would have been a good guess that the adrenal gland was pretty weak, and this would start to correct the um, severe pain because it would start to give you some anti-inflammatory effect. We also um, started him on a strong multivitamin and mineral, um, and then gave him B12 and folate. You can see the dose, 10,000 micrograms and 400 micrograms weekly, and recommended 12 weeks of full disability, breathing exercises, and yoga. And actually, you know, this is a recommendation that we make 8 to 12 weeks because we find that if you really want to turn somebody with this kind of scenario around, you have to be fairly strong about recommending that they take time off to get well. Um, and we actually fill out many of these forms on a regular basis. Um, so obviously we know that the breathing and the oxygenation reduce the acidity. Um, and at week three, following the program that we talked about just with these few things, um, the severe, uh, the energy level was actually a little bit better. Um, instead of one, two, it was a three, not much better. Uh, the severe pain was slightly better, um, and the sleeping was slightly better, and that's actually on melatonin of three milligrams. Um, the anxiety was slightly better, 
Um, and uh, there was no change in cognitive function or um, acid reflux. We really hadn't done anything with that yet. Uh, but we did get some um, serum levels at this point. The total testosterone was 225 with the bioavailable being 76. The DHEA was 10 and we're looking for a level of a greater than 150. The free T3 was 178 and even in their range that was considered to be low with a TSH of 7.0. TSH mostly reflects your T4. Um, so really this was just something that was not caught. Uh, the cortisol level was 5, but of course that would have been expected with the person being on prednisone. Um, and uh, so basically at this point, um, the things that were added were the last three, testosterone at 100 milligrams, um, hydrocortisone 5 milligrams three times a day, which is about 15 milligrams. You can do this in a couple of different ways. You can ask people to take hydrocortisone and give themselves 2.5 milligrams and every time they feel tired they can keep adding 2.5. If any of you have read the book by Jeffrey Williams on safe uses of cortisol, you can really use up to 20 to 30 milligrams of cortisol without having significant adrenal suppression. Um, so we use it liberally during the phase of trying to get people stabilized. Many people might be wary of using thyroid in a patient who looks like they have a pretty significant adrenal component, but what we found that it's, it's, it really goes too slow if you don't do any thyroid. And so what we do in these patients is we use a compounded bioidentical T3, T4, but always slow release. And the slow release seems to be tolerated in these patients much better. And I've also found that the speed of the recovery is much faster using a slow-release thyroid and starting it within the first couple of visits rather than waiting for the entire adrenal situation to correct. Um, this is actually this, this person's profile when the prednisone was off. And I just wanted to show you that the, the profile for the cortisol was running at the very base. And, and at that point, I increased the hydrocortisone at, at all points um, a little bit. Uh, so as far as nutrition, there's a certain basic supplementation that we use for every patient, a multivitamin mineral and an omega. You'll find that you'll be supported by Harvard and AMA uh, by using this kind of basic supplementation. Um, and I like to use just everything in one bottle, so I use a multivitamin that's complete uh, with the things that I need for adrenal glands and thyroid activation and um, and uh, progesterone and estrogen with 50 milligrams of zinc and 400 micrograms of uh, selenium. And then the next thing is that we always test. The test that I've been using is functional intracellular analysis. There's lots of different ways to test. Um, this one is something that I've used for a while with success, and I would say the different tests test different things. But I find the antioxidant function to be particularly useful because it really tells us about how aggressive we should be with antioxidants. Um, in this patient, the nutritional result came back being low in all the B vitamins, being low in magnesium, and being in the 23rd percentile for antioxidant function. And we're really looking for the 78th percentile or, or higher. Um, so, to the nutritional regimen, two things were added. One was magnesium glycinate, and I like the glycinate form because it gives you a little bit more bioavailability. Um, and uh, we use 240 milligrams three times a day. If people have diarrhea, we back them off, but we really are moving towards 800 to 1,000 milligrams in patients with adrenal issues. And in this patient, we also started Ivy Myers cocktails, which we did twice a week for the first three to four weeks. And that's what we usually do until they get back on their feet and are feeling quite a bit better. Because the antioxidant function was so, so low, we have a, a program here which we uh, call our superfood program where we teach them to use uh, superfoods that are dense in phytonutrients. If any of you have not read the book by David Wolf called, um, you know, called Superfoods, it's a great book to read. Um, and these are some of the superfoods, if any of you ever want to look at them. I always try to get four or five of these superfoods into my diet in every day, in between all the potato chips. Um, and uh, then we use a lot of these Genesis juices, which are um, 
wild harvested juices. Um, so basically we use a combination of different things to bring the antioxidant function up. Um, and this patient, I'm jumping forward to week six at this point, who was placed on the superfoods and the Ivy Myers cocktail and the hormones as you see here. Um, basically the energy level by week six, which is one and a half months in, uh, had come up to about a six and the severe pain all over down to a five. Um, and uh, this is on the testosterone, 100 milligrams, DHEA, the thyroid, and the hydrocortisone. Um, the patient was sleeping, there were no, and no anxiety or panic attacks. The memory and cognitive function were not any better yet, and we were still on as effects. So obviously, this would be the point to wonder whether or not it's time to do something about the bowel and liver. Um, we did get a or urine organics panel. This is one of the tests I got, got from Genova, which showed some things like ATP production defects and bowel problems and liver problems. Um, so we started a regimen, which we pretty much start in most people when we're doing, uh, trying to take them off of any kind of proton pump inhibitor, using enzymes and probiotics with every single meal a plant-based diet, and in this case, far infrared to give the kind of exercise that would get, uh, you know, give us the same effect as exercise uh, without actually exercising because this patient wasn't able to exercise yet. Um, the enzyme formula should be complete again, use, utilizing a number of different um, things for proteins and carbohydrates and uh, fats, and the probiotic should absolutely be upper and lower bowel Biotics so that it replaces the uh, entire uh, flora of the upper and the lower intestine. Um, the plant-based diet was used to alkalinize the body and reduce the digestive load. If any of you have read the China study, you'll note that, um, that this is uh, clearly the way to go. And uh, we've used this successfully for a whole lot of indications. Um, including irritable bowel and Crohn's and allergic conditions. We've had, we've had patients who've been to immunologists forever who have completely come off of their, um, completely come off of their uh, immune regimen just using things like this. We know the skin is a manifestation of, um, of the bowel, so obviously um, even the skin conditions can be reversed through this diet. It really consists of, for two to three months, using a lot of superfoods, um, but uh, eating vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, and avoiding all meat, fish, dairy, and eggs, and minimizing canned, boxed, processed, refined, fried, charred, and overcooked. So um, that's basically what the plant-based diet is. And the far infrared therapy we used two times a week uh, with this gentleman uh, coming in to just basically enhance cellular repair and increase blood flow. Uh, throughout, especially in patients who can't exercise, and this is technology which you may be familiar with, developed by NASA, but it's it's very very um, effective in these kind of patients. Um, at five months, um, this patient is uh, has pretty much a normal energy level, no pain, sleeping, so basically back to normal. Um, on this regimen, I'm showing you testosterone at 100 milligrams, DHEA 25. T3, T4, 152, melatonin, 3 milligrams, no hydrocortisone, the multivitamin, still on the B12, still on the omega, which we added later because uh, the patient wasn't tolerating it because of the reflux, but once the reflux got corrected, the omega got added uh, after the plant-based diet and bowel detox and uh, breathing exercises. Just to show you an antioxidant function, before and after, you can see there was quite a bit of difference, even before and after on the B vitamins. Um, so uh, five months later, we found that this patient went back to work. And, uh, and actually, uh, it was actually before uh, five months that this patient went back to work, but completely back to their normal functioning. It took five months. This patient was pretty sick, and it had taken them years to get there. Um, so I think I have maybe a little time to go through this. I wanted to show you an infertility case um, that, uh, that I had a 32-year-old with hypothyroidism and infertility who's on 75 micrograms of Synthroid and still complaining of everything that you would complain of for low thyroid, which is low energy, brain fog, um, 
cycles every 25 to 45 days. Um, and the patient was started on Synthroid and the TSH was 1.0. So after six cycles of Clomid and IUI, uh, the patient comes in and uh, looking at the model that we're talking about, the entire model, um, it becomes clear that we need to add T3 to this T4 because T4 alone is not going to do the trick. And in addition to the multivitamin, the B12, we added iodine. And, I, and so many of these patients just start cycling on the T3 and the iodine as soon as you start putting them on that. And we always recommend no counting and sex two to three times per week all month long because that takes the stress of counting away. And we know that the minute cortisol spikes, fertility drops. So that removes that. And, and basically, it's, it's a well known that when people stop counting, that's often when they get pregnant. Um, but on this regimen by week four, she uh, started having better energy. And if you look at the levels, the TSH actually came back normal. But again, the free T3 was very low. The progesterone was very low. And I've been uh, asked by many people, well, if you give progesterone to these patients, won't you suppress the cycling? Well, you can. But in order to suppress cycling, you'd have to be at about three, four milligrams of progesterone. So when you up to 100 milligrams, generally patients continue to cycle. So there's no problem with that. Um, so we started adding a low dose of uh, progesterone and also T3 slow release and iodine. And the form of iodine I'm using right now is Iosol, uh, which uh, is, uh, you can use it five drops every day and that'll give you about 12 milligrams. Um, by week eight, her energy is better, her mental fog is better. As soon as people start feeling better, you know there's, uh, they're better. Um, the cycles are every 25 to 45 days, still no change. The stress is a little better. Um, and when we order labs for week 12, we end up seeing that the free T3 corrected and the progesterone has corrected and the energy and mental fog have corrected. So the patient at this point had cycles twice a month and um, uh, I mean, for two months she actually had a cycle. So you know you've corrected the underlying imbalances. All of these things are always underlying imbalances and they lie in several different areas. Um, this patient has at this point had two babies, uh, but she got pregnant uh, about five months after we started with her. And um, so, you know, basically this is the model which uh, we use. And there's a lot of other cases. I, I'll be doing those at the workshop when I'm in Orlando um, uh, next month. But uh, just so you know that these are, you know, you can pretty much treat anyone, anyone uh, under this kind of uh, a model, and I always look at ourselves as, you know, as uh, the blind team looking at different parts of the of the big black box, which is the body. So we're trying to figure out what's going on on the inside by looking at the outside, and every little piece of information really helps. Um, I was asked to share some of the practice lessons, um, and I would say that the first thing was to start with a few things and add one thing at a time. And when I started, I started with estrogen and progesterone first. And uh, after a while, I added the testosterone and then the thyroid. And I would say it, it was about six to eight months into the practice that I started using thyroid. Um, and I would still agree with that. And I, I didn't know much about nutrients at all at that point. But I would say that it's the familiarity with how each piece affects the puzzle that actually creates a model that works. Um, and so, for example, you know, I have a lot of people say, well, you know, when do you add IV chelation? And when you, you know, what I found is I didn't add IV chelation to the practice until almost three to four years into the practice because I was really becoming familiar with one thing at a time. And I think what happens when we're exposed to so many possibilities, it's easy to get confused about where to start. Um, be focused on the best result for the patient first and, um, uh, focus on the top priorities of the patient first, which means when you have a patient in front of you who's complaining of hair loss and fatigue, but they weigh 350 pounds, your actions, even for hair loss and fatigue, are going to automatically start to address the weight loss. But I just find that these patients come in with certain things on their list, and they may not match what you see as the priority. So it's a matter of deciding together what the priority is going to be. We do email and phone inquiries. 
Um, but we do phone consultations also, and phone consultations, we, we require that the patient has seen us in-house, and then if we're following up by phone, we charge it just like an, uh, uh, like an appointment uh, otherwise. Um, the financial lessons that I learned is that insurance doesn't cover these services in network, and actually when we went out of network, because I started in network, when I went out of network, I found that um, the patients actually got better coverage out of network for our services, many patients getting coverage at 60 to 70 percent. So out of network provision does work. Um, we use the labs covered by insurance as much as possible. And you have to be very sensitive to this and we provide the paperwork for them to file. Um, the fee structure is here, which are new patient consoles. We kept our fees right within a uh, pretty regular range. We, we see about 55 patients a day. And uh, what I've realized, if I was to give you an overall idea of, um, of income in, in the practice, I would say that we have almost, we almost match the office visit with the supplement cost. Um, and, and the patients stay on the supplements because we choose only one or two things to put them on and ask them to repeatedly use the same thing. So what, what I'm saying is that our practice revenue is coming as much from um, recurrent retail as it is from seeing the patient in the office. And uh, this only occurred to me as an important factor when I walked away from my practice last year for a... Um, a family issue that I had and realized that the practice managed to keep itself alive because we still had the recurring or the recurring supplement use. So the, the two, two things are obviously I use them because they're the best for the patient, but also the, um, the, the revenue is important. So I think that, you know, the stability comes partly from something like that. Uh, so I think that brings me to the end of this, um, this presentation. And, um, I think we're ready for some questions. We can take a couple of questions if, if those are there. Definitely, Dr. Patty. Thank you so much. I was learning like everybody else, and we do have a nice group of people with some questions, so we'll take a few of them. Uh, one of the first questions someone said regarding the melatonin, uh, they said is that a they saw a hangover effect coming. How did you deal with that? Yeah, so it turns out that the dose of melatonin could be varying anywhere from 0 0.1 to 20 milligrams, and uh, people are variably sensitive. Uh, so we actually start with 0 0.5 milligrams and ask them to keep going up on it until they reach a dose which might be too high and then back down one. Um, there are some people who cannot even take a 0 0.5, and then we compound it uh, in the 0 0.1 milligram doses sublingually and ask them to play with it that way. Okay, thank you. The next question is, where did you get MVI? The multivitamin from MD Prescriptives. Okay, thank you. The next question was, do you use the challenge test to determine that she needs iodine? I have used the challenge test with the 50 milligram load and then collecting the 24 hour urine. Um, that test actually is covered by many insurances and I have used it, uh, but at this point I'm using the iodine spot test in the urine which is on the Quest and the Lab 4 and all of the regular lab sheets and it seems to be a covered thing. You can assume that over 90% of your patients are iodine deficient, but it still helps to look at the test. Um, so yes, I have used it and we still use it when we're confused, like if we have a patient who it seems may need more iodine but they're on a pretty good dose, we'll do the challenge test with the 50 milligrams of uh, uh, potassium iodide and iodine. Thank you. We got one or two more and then it says for the fertility case, did you give progesterone 6.25 milligrams daily or was it cycled? It was a daily dose, and it was not just 6.25 because she kept increasing the dose until she reached the dose at which she, she felt well, and I don't remember what the dose was, but I've had patients who are infertility patients who have gone up to 75 milligrams, and they take it all month long because it, it all it does is raise the 
bar of where the progesterone is cycling. Progesterone continues to cycle, it just cycles at a higher level. So you don't need to cycle it. Cycling is there already. Thank you. We have two more and the next question is, do you test for mold and what lab do you use? I have not tested for mold. Okay. And and it's an important it's an important thing to test for. I just haven't incorporated that into what we do yet. Thank you. The next question is, do you use transdermal cream for HRT in men or just IM and Y? Um, we offer all options to men because some men are not going to want the IM and some men are not going to want the cream. And each of them have their pros and cons. There are people who only do one or only do the other. And I find this to be quite limiting. When I have a discussion with a male about testosterone and they decide to take testosterone, I offer them transdermal, uh, IM, and pellets. And there's pros and cons to each one, which would be beyond the uh, me explaining it here. But the transdermals tend to have a little bit more, in a nutshell, more conversion. Um, uh, and so I think they really are only effective in about 70% of people. Uh, the IMs give you more of a roller coaster effect, but if you dose them sub two twice a week, people have excellent results. And uh, the pellet expensive, but also a good mechanism, but it gives you steady state. Well, you're getting a lot of questions. This is more questions than we had all last month. So you got time for two more? Of course. Okay. Do you use the lab normals for iodine, or is there an optimal range that you are striving for? If you use the, if you do the loading uh, test, then we use that. Uh, if it's greater than ninety percent excreted, that means greater than forty-five milligrams of a fifty-milligram dose. We consider them not to be iodine deficient. Thank you, and this will be the last question. Iodine is contradicted in Hashimoto's and 90% thyroid is Hashimoto's. Do you use iodine in Hashimoto's? Yes. Um, I understand that there is some uh, controversy about iodine in Hashimoto's, but my experience, see, the way I look at Hashimoto's is that it's an autoimmune condition that actually all, if you have antibodies to the thyroid, you probably have antibodies to a lot of other things. So it's not just to the thyroid. Um, and I think we're able to measure some of the antibodies around the body, but not all of them. And my experience has been that these are very iodine deficient and that the iodine actually is, it helps them quite a bit. It clinically helps them. Um, and sometimes you can't even get the result without it. And the best thing to do is measure. If they're high in iodine, they don't need it. But if they're low in iodine, they do, because iodine doesn't just have function on the thyroid. It happens to have multiple functions throughout the body, including if you're, if you're deficient in iodine, it also creates genetic uh, abnormalities. So any micronutrient, my approach to any micronutrient is test and treat, test and correct. Thank you, Dr. Patty. Now I want to ask you my question. Do you eat the potato chips before the yoga or the potato chips after the yoga? I eat them all day. <laughs> before and after. Thank you. I like that. That's a good answer. <laughs> well, anyways, I want to thank you so much for coming on and speaking to the members. I found it very informative and with all the questions, obviously, so did they. I look forward to seeing you in Orlando and everybody else that's going to be joining us in Orlando. And I look forward to getting you on next time to answer some more questions for all the people. So thank you so much. I know it's getting late over there. You have a great night. And goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.